we go. Whoops, I'm still a little blue. Because Michael left his monitor on here. There we go. Hey all. Um, no promises, but I am trying to get these this little series I'm doing here done uh, by next Saturday, actually. So, we'll see. I guess this is only Friday, isn't it? So I have a little more time than I thought, but let's move on. Final Fantasy II, right? Now, obviously, most people weren't exposed to Final Fantasy II until much more recently when the Origins came out and on the PlayStation 1. Now, granted, that was back in the uh, late 90s, I believe, 98 or something like that, but <laughs> which, which probably really dates me that I still think of that as recent, but let's move on. Regardless, the point I'm trying to get across is most people did not play it on the NES, and most people who have did so via the source of some kind of emulator, and for obvious reasons, you know. But Final Fantasy II really was a fascinating example of how a series progresses. Um, let's go ahead and start with the fact that the, the, the very reason why FF2 does deserve some degree of recognition, both good and bad. Um... I suddenly can't think of his name. I believe it's Hironobu Sakaguchi. I could be saying that wrong because I'm terrible at Japanese names. I suck at that. Um, the gentleman who is basically ha the, the main producer, the main director, the main guy who was in charge of the Final Fantasies all the way up until 6, basically, which is the one he wrote, and then he took more of a back seat from 7 and on. That gentleman had an idea and... and ran it by the rest of the crew when they when they got together to do another game. They had a lot of options, you know. Final Fantasy was the big success story. It made a lot of money. It sa salvaged the company. It rejuvenated their faith and their confidence within themselves and made the game... Uh, how do I put this? It made a sufficient enough money, both here and in Japan, that making another game was basically greenlit immediately. And they had all sorts of options, all sorts of choices. One of the first things they decided to do was not to have a degree of continuity between them. Now, there are some rumors, I do not know of the validity thereof, that uh, Hironobu did actually have a degree of very vague sketches, very vague, you know, thought, uh, free thought uh, process. I can't think of the term I'm thinking of here. It, just general thoughts of how you could tie the games in together and how they could be brought together, and it is debatable as to whether or not that's how they ended up starting to tie in the FFs, because later on the FFs did start to have a, a degree of real continuity between them, uh, usually in rather vague and quiet terms. But the point remaining here is the fact that they made the conscious choice with Final Fantasy II not to make it the sequel to Final Fantasy I. And the reason they did that, and this is the important part, this is kind of the point I'm trying to get to with this whole thing, is because they didn't want to limit themselves. They didn't want to tie their story in to Final Fantasy One. They didn't want to tie it. In. It is possible, and indeed probable, that the world of FF Two, or I'm sorry, the setting of FF Two, is simply another region of the same world. It is. It it would be easy to explain such a thing away, or whatever. But that's not. As far as the game is concerned, FF Two and FF One were completely segregate, right? Now, that is also relevant because. The very next thing they decided was to take all of the systems, all the innovations they'd come up with, and fling them out the window for Final Fantasy II. <laughs> and they had this sort of rule, and I say sort of rule. I gotta stress this, because this is what I really want to talk about here. FF2 started the let's do things different law, but it wasn't a law back then. It didn't become a law until, I believe, FF8, actually. I could be wrong about that. Because the basic concept was... Rather than use the things we've already come up with as a crutch, let's go ahead and try to come up with something new. Let's try to keep innovating. Let's try to keep being creative. Let's try and keep our brains engaged and come up with a new system and a new style and a new theme each time. Each game was supposed to have a different core element, core theme, and a core system to it, right? And that is a trend that has continued to this day. The problem here is somewhere along the line... Again, this became a law rather than a guideline, you know, a, a rule, you know. The, originally, it was just, well, let's try and make it different, and occasionally they didn't. Occasionally they were like, well, we, don't want, we, we, we want to do something like this, but it's not going to work, and we don't want to do something completely different, so we're just going to modify an existing system, modify an existing thing, and use that for the next game. And they did that twice uh, up, into, up until the FF8 era. Uh, te technically three times, but let's not get into that. And it worked. It worked just fine because it was just a guideline. When you lay down a hard rule about something that is supposed to be creative, 
you've already failed, is what I'm trying to get across here. And it is such a shame because that requirement of you have to be different each time has continued unto the modern age. There's a reason why 10.2 is using a completely different system than 10, and why 13 is, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's a reason each game has a completely different system. It's because it's a requirement now. And I personally think that is a weakness. I think when it was a guideline, it was it was fine. And I think that when it was dealing with a, hand, a handful of games, it was fine. But we're in the double digits now, and there's only so often so much you can innovate and, cre and be creative about with, in regards to a system. Everything is already at the point of just fine shades of each other. Now, I'm not trying to discourage creativity. Far from it. I'm just trying to say that when you try to force creativity, it usually shows, if you know what I mean. Now, that being said, Final Fantasy II was responsible for the good and the bad sides of that. That was the first time they said, okay, let's do everything different. And I will go on record as saying, you know, FF2 is, in my opinion, the worst system of the FFs. I'll get into that more later. But the point is, they, ne the, the, the second part of this, the most important part, actually, really, is the themes. The fact that each Final Fantasy was going to be a segregate story, you know, not a sequel, and it was going to have a differing theme. Final Fantasy 1 didn't actually have much of a theme. They've gone back uh, in in more recent works and in Dissidia and tried to give uh, a theme to Final Fantasy 1, but it wasn't really designed with one to begin with. Not really. It was basically your generic RPG. Not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with that, but it was an RPG. It was an epic adventure. It was a fantasy adventure, you know. That's what it was supposed to be. From 2 and on, they actually were reaching for something. They were trying to get a specific feeling, a, a specific concept there. And uh, Final Fantasy II is most often, uh, by me, expressed as law versus... Uh, or, I'm sorry, order versus chaos, or law versus chaos, if you prefer. You could also call it oppression versus freedom, because that's it's the same basic way it is presented in this game. The whole point of the theme of FF2 was the concept of the two extremes, how they interact with each other, and why neither one of them really work. And it, it it's uh, the, the subtleties of this theme are really only apparent when you get into the remakes, when you have actual dialogue trees and all that fun stuff. But they are there, they are present, and they are... They, they they did the same general type of thing they did with Final Fantasy 1, but they decided to do it in a, in a fairly different direction. What I mean by that is the holes thing. I was talking about in FF1, there were uh, guidelines, you know, signposts on the road, but there was no actual road there, just signposts, and so you, you filled in the road yourself, right? With FF2, that's still present, but to a much lesser extent, and I think this was a good thing. I think this is where the Final Fantasy series really started, was because what they did instead was rather than have this expansive epic adventure, they actually shrunk it. FF2 overall is a much smaller game in terms of scope, in terms of size, in terms of... Uh, I don't know, epicness, you know, concept, or how, I, I don't want to say concept, but it, the overall feel of the game is much more here, but the benefit of that is within the limitations of the hardware and the cartridge and the software, what they were able to do was, with this smaller size, fill it in much more, and so there actually is detail, there actually are, there actually is backstory, you actually do find out about these characters, you actually do start to care about them, you know, they have a fairly large number of character deaths in Final Fantasy 2, you know, spoiler alert, and with a couple of exceptions, they do all actually mean something and still manage to to impact emotionally, even after all this time, especially in the remakes where they actually do them properly. And especially, especially in the remakes where they have the second story thing. I don't actually remember what they call it in FF2. I'll, I'll get to that more when I talk about the remake at the end, so let's just move that over to the side. But the overall theme, the overall concept of Final Fantasy II, the, the, the more tightly focused story, the, the idea of actually having character development, all of that was new, and there's one really important thing they decided to do, and, and this is a trend that has continued throughout this, this series. The only exception was FF3 on the NES, and they actually undid that. What I'm talking about is the fact that they gave you characters, not avatars. Rather than having the party, rather than having the player characters or whatever, you are instead piloting actual characters with their own names, their own backstories, their own personalities that are regardless of you. And that was a decision they had to make. They had to decide, are we going to go the route of allowing the players to continue to choose their personalities, role, etc., which would be its own concept and probably would have, if they had chosen that way back then, the Final Fantasy series probably would have evolved in a completely different manner and probably branched more into what we 
now see as you know the Elder Scrolls, for example. Or, uh, or modern Bioware games, but instead they chose to go the opposite route. They wanted to tell a story, and they wanted this story to have meaning. And in all frankness, if you're going to do that, especially at the limitations of the time, it is uh, significantly easier, and uh, the creator has more tools to work with, basically, if you instead limit the characters, or, or rather, I should say, make it so the characters are the characters, rather than whatever the player is creating with their avatar here. And so with that, they could go over in this direction, and, and all the FFs have followed sweet, suit thereafter. It was an interesting choice, honestly. And I have to imagine, I would have been absolutely fascinated to be in any of the meeting rooms where they were discussing FF2, because it was FF2... I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in detail, but it's relevant because FF2 is where the FF series actually began, if you follow what I'm saying here. FF1 was the last hurrah, the, the attempt, our, our, our swan song, and it worked. It went beautifully, and all of a sudden they had budget, and all of a sudden they had funding and, and, and job security, and they could actually expand the studio, they could actually expand the works, and now, okay, we want to do an FF2. What do we do? I would have loved to have been in in on those meetings and to hear the thoughts and the pro and the the the, the 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 flow stream of consciousness the flow of consciousness uh, that's kind of what I was thinking of earlier, of of the different people and all the different ideas that were surely bouncing off each other because they had what was effectively infinite options there they could have gone wherever with it, and what they decided was we want it to be more story focused which I think is a good thing. Uh, they wanted to be more character-focused, because in FF1, there were only a few characters that you had any concept or, or interest in dealing with. In fact, name characters in Final Fantasy 1 that are not the Four Fiends and is not Chaos. And I'm not talking about the main characters. Uh, also, Garland counts here for the main guys. And if you name any character that you only know of because of 8-bit theater, thank you for proving my point. <laughs> In Final Fantasy II, all, fairly, a fairly large number of NPCs all of a sudden were characterized. All of a sudden they had personality. All of a sudden they had multiple lines. You know, All of a sudden you would hear about the princess and why she was uh, doing this and what exactly had happened with the Empire and how they had taken over your town and how they had killed your parents. And you would find out about you know what exactly happened with... Uh, I suddenly can't think of his name. Oh my goodness. The, the, the awesome NPC, the, the mage, who was awesome. I can't think of his name. Ah. Well, whatever. I'm bad with names. You know that. It, I know I'm talking about, darn it. How about the gentleman who died, and, you know, you have to go and give the news to his daughter back in the town, and she just kind of quietly, you know, she you don't tell her, but she knows that he's gone, and she's just trying to stiff up her lip, but, you know, she's just dying inside because her father just died. That type of thing was something that FF2 started, and that's something that's been a hallmark of the FF series ever since, because they took that and they were good at it. The fact that they can pull that kind of emotion out of a NES game is all I have to say about that. Sorry if I'm going on and on about this, but I really do think this deserves mention, this deserves discussion, because, my goodness. Um, hang on just a second. I have someone talking to me about Skyrim. How dare you talk to me about Skyrim! Ah, gotcha. Okay. Um... But speaking of the differentiation, I'm only going to talk about this... Well, I, I guess I could go ahead and mention... Uh, <laughs> see, the problem is, on top of the, the different scope, the different style, the different type of game, really, when you get down to it, Final Fantasy II also had a completely different system to it. They completely coded it from the ground up, basically. A lot, uh, Some of the graphics were... Excuse me, were... Uh, 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 recycled from Final Fantasy 1, and some of the code was recycled from Final Fantasy 1, the, the combat code. Uh, but that's basically it. And in fact, actually, that's not that's being disingenuous, because it, even the combat code was completely rewritten. So much of the, the system, the mechanics behind it, were, were written from scratch in order to accommodate the new system, and that was part of the thing, too. We want to be different each time, right? So what they had instead was this system, uh, the Final Fantasy Legends system, or the Saga system, if you prefer as I've heard it referred to, where you don't actually have levels. It's a it's a use system, and it's always been flawed. I've never seen anything that has actually implemented this properly. Not unless you count Asheron's Call, but that doesn't count, because it didn't implement it properly as far as this goes. It actually implemented a different system, which actually works. This system has never been exactly what it should be, because it always relies on you, you know, okay, I have to hit you to increase my sword skill, which increases my damage. I have to be hit in order to increase my HP. I have to not be hit in order to increase my ability to dodge. 
honestly, logical progression will explain why that system doesn't work. <laughs> Not in a long-term sense. It's just irritating, to be completely honest with you. I I'm sorry, that is an opinion. It is uh, irritating to me, and I can't stand that system, but even ignoring my opinion on the matter, logical progression will show that all you're doing is encouraging players to grind their brains out in a very specific manner in order to raise a stat. You could s argue that leveling does that too, but leveling also has its own benefits and detriments, and frankly, I don't want to get into that too much. I personally prefer the leveling system, partially because it's a little more guaranteed, partially because it doesn't require nearly as much grind, and partially because when you are deciding on a difficult difficulty curve for a game, you have to assume a certain level of overall power that the player has at any given point, right? That's how you make it challenging. There is that, you know, you always want to hit that band of not too, you know, not too difficult, but not too easy. You want to hit this little spot right here. And this is an extremely hard spot to hit in a game where the player has the control of how strong they are. Hitting that in an RPG with levels is pretty relatively simple. All you have to do is aim for right about here, you know, the end. When you have this kind of system, you either have to do this or go ahead and live with this, but because the player power isn't actually one line, it's actually like six lines, their HP is over here, their attack power is up here, but their magic is up here, you know, they're going, there's going to be holes, there's going to be problems with that, and so forth and so on, and that's one of the reasons I think that was a failed idea, and indeed, let, let's be honest, they didn't do that again with the Final Fantasies, and there's a good reason for that. They, uh... They managed to keep going that with that in the Saga series because they, they augmented it. They they did it in different styles and different ways, and, and you know, that worked for them. Huh, but it is a strangeness, too, because Final Fantasy I didn't really have this problem, but Final Fantasy II and Dragon Quest both had the difficulty... Uh, and this is more or less a, an, an artifact of design... Fl where, okay, if you can imagine this is the 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 screen right now, uh, is what you're looking at, and you're up here, and here's the starter town, you do this. This was especially true in Dragon Quest. You go down here, actually, I guess I'm doing this in reverse, aren't I? You go down here, and you go over to the left. I know this is my right, but you get the point here. I actually have no idea how this is going to look on your screen, so whatever. The point is, you start up on the upper right, you go to the lower left here, and then what you encounter is enemies that are eh, about three layers of difficulty higher than what you're supposed to be doing right now, and they stomp you into the ground and you're back in town and you've lost half your gold. Or worse. <laughs> you know? But let's move on from that. The story. I want to talk about the story a bit. Final Fantasy II was a very strange story in its own right, because... You can tell that the only reason the story wasn't more epic, more awesome, more fleshed out was purely because of the limitations of the system and the design. Now, the, the remakes did away with some of these problems and really helped flesh out a lot of it, but you, there was really a lot of effort, a lot of oomph that was put into Final Fantasy II's story. You really could tell they were going for uh, what, what most people nowadays refer as to as the Star Wars saga type thing, you know? And that's fine, actually. I think that works great. That type of story is a fantastic type of story if it's done properly, and FF2 did a pretty good job of it. One of the things that's really worth noting here is that, as I mentioned earlier, with, with, with actual characterizations, the NPCs, you actually had a more personal connection, not just to the story as, as overall, but through these individual connections, but to the specific lives you're interacting with. Now, there was a bit of a sacrifice that had to be made. As I mentioned, it's more like here. So the setting of FF2 does feel much smaller. It does feel much more contained. It does feel much more linear than Final Fantasy 1 did. But it was done as a specific choice in order to allow them to expand on the story and the characterization. I think that was a good choice, personally, um, for basically the same reason I think the choice in FF1 was. They were limited, and they decided to, rather than focus on the same specializations they did in FF1, to focus on these ones instead. Worked out very well. The overall concept of the, the the ancient the empire thing this is another thing that ff2 started in the ff series the ff series has always had a fondness for you know the big overarching empire or organization or company or whatever that is a religion that is you know evil you probably has some decent people in it uh, ff2 only had the one and even he would still wanted to rule the world let's be honest with ourselves but 
nevertheless, the, you know, the, the, that kind of a backdrop was a story t design they enjoyed, and I don't actually blame them for it. It's one I enjoy myself as well. I'm not actually using it in my most recent campaign, but I have used that before and more than once, because what you have with an empire like that, with a situation like that, is, is a twofold possibility. One, you have a clearly defined villain, and it's very easy to show that villain being villainous. One of the greatest decries against that sort of thing, and I'm not going to go into depth in this because I could talk about this for a long time, is the I was only following orders mentality, which actually effectively illustrates the fact that the empire in question, and it doesn't have to actually be an empire. I know the technical dictionary definition of an empire. We're not talking about that. The, the unit, the group, the organization in question, is committing crimes against its own people by, through its policies, forcing them to become things they do not want to be and to do things they do not want to do. And that gives you not only a designated villain, but in many ways a sympathetic villain. And another layer here is the fact that it also gives you the possibility of having not, not just outright rebels and people who disagree, but ordinary everyday people who have nothing to do with the atrocities that this organization is 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 enacting and yet nevertheless are passively responsible by through their lack of resistance for the actions thereof and and what this does is it lets you the person decide what where you want to stand on it basically there's so much room for opinion here and none of them are wrong, which is one of the things I like about that. So I like that usage of that as a story mechanic, as as a as a, as a plot mechanic. I, I don't have words for it. <laughs> I, I, it's been a while since I've been in college, and I was never good at the vocabulary. Let's be honest with ourselves. But I know what I'm talking about, damn it, because it's an excellent unit. It's an excellent point to to use to construct the the formula that is a story, and. I think that FF2 really showed that, really showed the beginnings of that. Obviously, they can only do so much with it. As I mentioned, the one plot twist, which I'm actually going to go ahead and talk about right now, the whole fact that... Excuse me. The... Okay, l l let me take that step back, actually. The plot twist in Final Fantasy One was present. And, and indeed, let's be honest, most FFs have a plot twist of some type or another. Some have been good, some have been amazing. You know, some have been kind of predictable, to be honest with you, but in general, the FFs do have a plot twist. It's something that's sort of become a standard norm. I'm actually going to take a moment and, and, and talk about this, because I think this is another one of those problems with a uh, a guideline becoming a rule and that being a bad thing. Early on, they did want to have a plot twist. They wanted that point at which in the story where the audience goes, <gasps> you know, and I have to say it like that, because nowadays the term plot twist is almost cliché. In fact, it's like saying cliché. There was once a point in time in, in creative work where calling something a cliché was not actually an insult. It was just a commentary on its style of usage. And nowadays, when you say it's a cliché, you're usually saying it to insult it. The same thing has become true of a plot twist. Oh, what a twist, you know, what a twist, you know, that whole thing. And all everything that has come from that, the usage of plot twist has become so common and so banal in most common society that most people use that as an insult. I just want to stress that they were not doing this because it was common or droll or mundane or boring or whatever. The point here was the usage of a, of, of a reveal. I want to use that term instead. A reveal in the story that made the... that it hopefully in, in, that engendered two res responses within the, the player. One... You know, what I just mentioned, oh my god, you know, or I can't believe that, or whoa, or that's awesome, you know, something along those lines. You know, a reaction, an actual emotional reaction at the reveal. And two, and most importantly, make them think about it. Make them actually reconsider everything that they knew up to that point and, and re-evaluate it all based on the new information that was now revealed to them. An excellent example of this would actually be the Kingdom Hearts series, whose plot line, every single game thus far has had a twist, or a reveal, as I prefer to call it, and each one has been designed with that concept in mind. You can tell that through the way it's presented, through the way it's the writing. And the Final Fantasy series, up to a certain point, did that as well. But again, it became a law somewhere along the line that they had to have that reveal, that they had to have the twist, and it became a little bit more and more forced as time went on. 
I think the last game that had a, a reveal that actually caught me with any level, shape, or form was probably FF10. And it is worth noting that the FF10, I'm just going to talk, I'll talk about this more when I get to FF10, but the, the usage of a reveal right at the beginning in order to cover another reveal, which is actually coming much later in the game, I thought was brilliant. And really showed the fact that the creative people working at Square at the time, I think, I'm not sure if they're Square Enix just yet, but, you know, Square, uh, realized the fact that this reveal thing, this twist rule, was getting a little old, and they had to start being creative about it in order to make it work, and then they stopped making it work after that point. But let's move on here. Back to FF2. Back to FF2. In FF1... No, no, I went too far! Ah! Back in FF1, though, the reveal had to do with the overarching plot. The reveal had to do with the villain and the nature thereof and what the plot actually was. You don't actually know the plot, uh, or rather, I should say this right, you, you know about the story, but you don't know what the villain's plot was. You don't know what his plan was until the reveal. And then he reveals exactly what was going on, and then it all makes sense, right? That was the style of reveal for, they were going for. And in keeping with the tone of everything has to be different in Final Fantasy II, they wanted a different type of reveal, a different emotional level of attachment. And in this case, what they went for was the personal one. In this case, the gentleman you saw literally in the, in the second scene, right after the text finishes scrolling, and, and you know, and you're in the battle sequence. That guy right there, that's the guy who's been hounding you this whole damn time. Now, if you're playing the Origins version or any of the remakes, that reveal is given away the very first time you talk to him because of the way they redid the graphics and all that. But back in the NES, back in the original edition, it was actually quite a shock when that reveal came out. It was not something that was anticipated. It was not something that was hinted at at all. There was nothing. It's just all of a sudden, by the way, he's actually this guy. Oh my god, you know. It was actually very well done. And the whole point was to get across... There, there was a lot of unspoken uh, revelation within that reveal. You know, the thought that one of the... Ch the three children rose up in order to become the leaders of the rebellion and the forces that refused to sit down and lay, and lay down before the oppression. You know, the forces of the, the freedom versus the forces of the oppression. You know, as I was saying earlier to the major themes. But one of those children chose oppression. One of those children chose to become the villain, and did so willingly. There was no mind control. There was no, you know, oh, my, he's secretly my father. And I, No, no, it was simply the differentiation in his mentality and his personality and the way he perceived the circumstances. All four of them were under the exact same set of, of circumstances. Right here, it's linear, it's flat. But the f fourth one reacted differently. And I thought that was an extremely important point, and it really highlighted the fact that these were for lack of a better term, humans. These were people. These weren't just robots or, or caricatures. These were individuals who react to things differently, who function differently, who think differently, who feel differently. And there was so much that was unspoken about that, you know, how different would it have been? Because all four of the children were exceptional. That was established early on. And for someone to so dedicate themselves to that oppression, to the empire, to the organization, to building up their power, and to building up their rule, he wanted to take over in the emperor's place all along, and it was obvious from the way he was functioning. And he actually states it flat out when the, after you've killed the emperor and you finally confront him. You know, I'm I'm the new emperor now. I am the rule of the empire, and now we're doing things my way. And this is it was clear. This is what he'd been building for this exact moment. And then the actual emperor came back and <laughs> took it from him in an awesome scene. But what's I'll talk about that in a minute. I have a whole bullet point here dedicated to the emperor. I'm not kidding. But oh shoot, I I meant to do that starting FF1. I'll start that in this game. I'm sorry, guys. I meant to do a couple a uh, couple things for each of these videos, and I'll talk about that later. But my point I'm getting across is this reveal was designed to be more personal, and it worked very well, in my opinion. And it really made you think about the thing, made you think about every interaction you've had with that character previously, and what exactly happened in his mind and his heart in, in order to get him to, to change, or rather, not to change, but simply to be in that line of thinking, in order to accept that, in order to choose that, for that matter. Really thought that was well done. Now, I'm going to go ahead and talk, uh, let's go ahead and switch that to the end here. Hang on just a second. Uh, uh -huh. Actually, no, we need to do it in this order, don't we? Sorry, guys. I'm an idiot, what can I say? There we go, okay. Uh, I'm an idiot, no more gold, eh? Uh, okay, so, next thing I want to talk about is actually the 
difficulty of the game. Final Fantasy II is the hardest RPG I've ever played in my life. I mean that sincerely. Even ignoring the fact that you can grind your face to the bone in that game in order to get somewhere, and kind of had to, the game was just flat unforgiving. And I do mean completely unforgiving. It was brutal. It was r vicious. It was horrible. I actually considered it a point of absolute pride. I guess I still do to the matter. I still consider it a point of absolute pride that I beat FF2 on the NES. No cheats. No, there weren't any cheats. And I didn't know about the bug, which I know about now. No cheating. No bugs. No hacking. Just work. And it took me a long time and a lot of patience. And I did it. And I am still proud of that fact. The, I have, of course, beaten the remake and with much less effort because they toned it down a lot. Thank God. <laughs> but FF2 was a brutally hard game. And in fact, that difficulty and the, 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 my disdain for the... Uh, I shouldn't say disdain, that's too harsh. My, my disinterest with the leveling system are the reasons why FF2 has been at the bottom of the list of my preference for so long, as far as the FFs go. It is, no, it is not at the bottom of the list. In fact, it's actually at the number 11 slot, for anyone who's curious. But I do, nevertheless, I, I just feel like uh, mentioning this, because, you know, when I think of difficult games, two of the games that leap to my mind immediately are Final Fantasy II and Breath of Fire II. Completely unforgiving, brutally difficult games that required you to grind in order to be capable of continuing forward. You know, every fight is a boss fight kind of a thing. Hua, you know? But anyways, I just wanted to mention that as an aside. I'm sure many people are going to come in here and comment and think, Oh, I thought the game was easy. That That's great. I, I stand by my statement. I have no shame about this fact. FF2 is hard, damn it. Moving on. Now, what I'm going to do... I, I'm sorry I forgot about this, but I want to talk about uh, four aspects of the game uh, in, in each review here. Uh, music the last dungeon, the villain, or villains as the case may be pre relevant, and the last boss and how that was handled. Uh, I sort of talked about that in FF1, but ultimately all four of those were only sort of present, if you know what I mean, in FF1. It wasn't until FF2 that we have the concrete, you know, syst uh, system in place here that, that, that every FF following will have. So let's talk about the music. Final Fantasy II is the first FF that has music that I specifically went out of my way to acquire. Don't get me wrong, I actually really uh, am in awe of the talent of Nobuo Mitsu in managing what he did with Final Fantasy 1, but none of the songs from FF1, to this day actually, are songs that I just want to sit and listen to. By contrast, there are several from Final Fantasy 2 that I actually really enjoy. And still, to this day, I still have them on my iPod, the original 8-bit versions, and of course the re there's multiple remakes that have been made. You know, the Pandemonium comes to mind, an actual last dungeon theme for that matter, oh my gosh, and so forth and so on. Very good songs, and I very much enjoy them. And and I and it it really speaks to the experience of the man because you could tell that he did a good job of Final Fantasy One. He received his accolades. He 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 had his his uh, job security, and he could have just coasted with that. And instead, what he did was say, "How can I do this better?" And he did. He actually did better. He. It's another thing Nobumitsu always did back in the older days, at the very least until FF7. The man experimented. The man tried different things. He was like, "Well, you know, I I could do it this way, or I could do it that way." And he would usually do it that way, just over there, kind of like that. And sometimes it wouldn't work. And then he'd pick himself up and keep going. Uh, tons of respect for the man. I. Uh, Excuse me. And so I, I just felt like p pointing out the fact that FF2, again, was basically, in, in, in my viewpoint, the start of Nobu Ometsu's meteoric rise to being one of the greatest composers I've ever heard. He took something that was, was so incredibly limited and said, I can do better with the already insane limitations. If I walked up to most modern musicians or composers who have never, ex who are, you know, newer, or never experienced the older era of, of, of music limitations and said, I want you to make a song that is an epic that has four channels and two instruments, go. They would either balk or think I'm kidding. Or think I'm insane when I, I pointed out that I'm not kidding. You know what I mean? Tons of respect for the man. So, let's talk about The Last Dungeon. Uh, I, I guess Remakes is on here too, but I mentioned that back in FF1. I'll leave that for last. The Last Dungeon, the Pandemonium, was was incredibly well done, I think, in FF2. It was everything a Last Dungeon should be. <laughs> Which is funny, because 
it was also it's also the second most difficult last dungeon I've ever been through. The most difficult for anyone who's curious is in the Infinity Dungeon in Breath of Fire 2. But in all seriousness, the the concept of every single fight, every single encounter being a boss fight, every single step you take, you have to be cringing because you might fight something else, desperately wanting nonetheless to keep going further because you want that incredible gear because the best gear in the game is there. This is another thing that they started uh, actually in FF1, but only to a lesser extent. FF2 really took the idea and ran with it. Having the best gear in the last dungeon. I've actually spoken out in the past against that sort of thing for reasons I'm not going to get into. Summary, I prefer New Game Plus, therefore it's okay, but it's not when there isn't, so let's just move on. But it actually worked, especially back in the day, because when you have a very difficult last dungeon and you have the best gear in there, you are actively rewarding the player for A, being prepared for this place, B, going out and seeking that extra loot, and, excuse me, and, 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 or I'm sorry, A, B, yeah, B, and C, I think I misspoke there, and C, actually having the, the knowledge and skill of their team and exactly how to use their abilities in order to squeeze performance, if you know what I mean, you know, in order to, to eke out just a few extra points of damage or living or, or healing or whatever, in order to make it further and get the gear, which they were then rewarded with and actually capable of, of doing even better and blah blah blah, if you follow what I'm saying here. It is also worth noting that Final Fantasy II has the interesting distinction of basically... Uh, I shouldn't say basically, of having the most difficult last boss in the history of the Final Fantasy. If I'm remembering correctly, there was some kind of bug or glitch regarding him, and I don't remember what it is anymore, and frankly I don't care, because I didn't know about that when I beat him legitimately. If you're fighting him legitimately, then the Emperor is the most difficult last boss in a Final Fantasy I've ever played. Bar none. You know, no one else even comes close to him. It is also worth noting, and I'm going to go ahead and say this here, the Final Fantasy series... Uh, percentage-wise, has a, uh, a a history of having last bosses that are kind of pathetic, to be put completely honest. As far as difficulty goes, I should say. Not as far as anything else. Just the difficulty curve. And there is actually a specific reason for that. And I will talk about that reason when we reach FF5, uh, actually, I think is where that really started. So... I just wanted to mention that it, re it really was refreshing that when you get to the Emperor and you actually fight him, he was brutal, and with good reason. And I guess I just kind of squished Last Dungeon and Last Boss into one sequence, so hey, whatever. But I want to talk about the villain last here before I get into the remake just a little bit. The villain is Emperor Mateus Palamecia, and he is one of the biggest badasses in the history of Final Fantasy. Let me explain this a little bit, shall I? A lot of the more recent Final Fantasy villains had several things that really make them stick out. Interesting characterization, a uh, certain level of however you define it, what is effectively cool factor. You know, Kefka had his own cool factor, Sephiroth had his own cool factor, Adia had her own cool factor. They were in completely different ways, but when you get down to it, it is effectively something that is effectively a cool factor. They were cool, they were interesting, they usually were at least mildly characterized, they were usually actually very well characterized, oftentimes more than the main characters, as is the nature of villains. You know, and they were usually demonstrated to be personally powerful. The only there are very few exceptions to this last rule. Uh, you know, Ultimicia, for example, could take on the party, uh, theoretically at least, and wipe the floor with them, but couldn't you know snap her fingers and and blow up a, a town, for example. Uh, Sephiroth, despite all his incredible power and all the demonstrations he does thereof, nevertheless ultimately had to utilize ancient and forgotten magic in order to summon a meteor in order to cause some real damage in order to enact his plan you know blah 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 kefka had to absorb uh the sources of magic for the world in order to become at the level and able to do that sort of thing and even then he didn't quite do it because his brain was so screwed up that he never actually got around to to wiping out reality i could go on emperor mateus was simply power walking. There was almost no characterization for Mateus as far as personality, as far as characters, uh, uh, backstory. The only thing we know about Mateus is that he was probably the single most powerful mage in Final Fantasy history. He, there's a reason why when they started doing, looking at the Dissidia project, they made, made a point of making em Emperor Mateus one of the main villains, and the guy who was calling the shots in both games, actually. There's a very good reason for that. Yes, I know Chaos was the actual main villain, but you get what I'm saying here. They, well, actually, Shinryu was the actual villain, but let's just move on. And you could argue that Sid was, but again, 
Let's, let's, gotten to get, let's not get into technically laser complications here. The point I'm trying to get across is Emperor Mateus was simply that strong. Emperor Mateus is a guy who built and ruled an empire based on basically nothing more than his own might, had it build a super weapon dreadnought that could wipe out cities that succeeded at doing so, and then when that dreadnought was then taken out by the only force that could do so, said, okay, I can deal with that, and personally created a cyclone, a whirlwind of immense power that was able to obliterate whatever, I don't even remember the name of the towns anymore, and maintain, it, the winds were so powerful he could actually, or maybe he was just doing it magically, but nevertheless, he was actually maintaining a floating fortress in the middle of this massively powerful whirlwind by nothing more than his sheer might of will. And then he died on purpose so that he could go to hell and heaven, take over both, and come back even stronger. Now, yes, you could argue that no villain in any FF history is actually difficult because, or I'm actually actually powerful because they're beaten in the end. But frankly, I've always kind of ignored that, and for a very simple reason: the good guys have to win, and you can't argue for the PC, uh, the player factor. I'm not going to get into the actual uh, meta sense of that. The bottom line is ignoring their defeat at the very end, which most of the time has to do with, you know, it has been handled properly a few times. Most of the time, it has to do with the fact that you're the player; that's why you win. But ignoring that fact, Emperor Mateus was simply power incarnate, and, and nothing else, really. He was such a powerful force that he, by himself, single-handedly, for all intents and purposes, moved the world, moved the history and knowledge and geography and, and of the entire planet, and the lives of every single one we encounter in it are, are changed and altered by his force, often directly, if you know what I'm saying. And I want to stress again, he died on purpose so he could take over the afterlives, plural. <laughs> That's Emperor Mateus. Now, that segues nicely into the last thing I want to talk about here. Uh, and that would be the... Also, he has an awesome name. But that would be... The last thing I want to talk about is the, uh, the, the, the remake, which I believe wasn't until the Game Boy Advance remake. I could be wrong about that. But the extra stuff. This is the first time a remake had done that. You know, but when they did the Final Fantasy I remake, the original remake, Origins, they didn't add anything to it. It wasn't until later that they added the additional dungeon and stuff. And they did this to FF1 and 2 simultaneously, actually. Actually adding additional content, though. In FF1, it was just an additional dungeon. Another dungeon, some more bosses, and some more loot. Not that I'm complaining. But they did that very much on purpose because... That was Final Fantasy 1. Final Fantasy 2 was story-based. Final Fantasy 2 was about characterization. And they did the most brilliant thing they could have possibly done. For those of you who don't know, uh, feel free to stop the video here. This is basically the last thing I'm going to say. but Because I don't want to spoil it, because this is awesome. I strongly recommend you play the remake with, with the optional dungeon thereafter. Fair warning. Okay. What happens is all of the NPCs who join your party and died during the course of the game you end up controlling them as your new party in the afterlife, in heaven, and fighting your way through this fortress that has managed to find its way to heaven. And at the end of it, you find the emperor, the light emperor. Now, he, this is the super optional, as, as I like to call the term. And he is there. He, he tries to convince you that, you know, he, he just wants peace and love, but of course it is a lie. He is simply after all more power, just like he always has been, because he's Mateus. He's the Emperor, damn it. There's a reason why his only name for years was just the Emperor. But that whole sequence, I, I don't even have much else to say about that, but it was such a beautiful, creative tool showing you, not only did it give you a bit of a hope spot, because all these players, all these characters had died, and several of them, at the very least, two of them, were characters that you cared about, that you actually were sad that they died. Seeing them continuing on in, in the afterlife provided just a little bit of comfort, a little bit of, a little bit, a little bit of uh, soothingness, I guess is the word I want to, I'll go with comfort, in order to the scene, or to the setting for that matter, to the story as a whole, and knowing that not only were they dead, but they were still fighting to help the party, and in fact, the way it works is, you know, if this is FF2 proper and this is the side thing, the side thing starts around here, FF2 goes here, and then they both continue, and both last fights with the Emperor, with the Hell Emperor and with the Heaven Emperor are actually fought at the exact same time, uh, story-wise. So, while you're climbing up Pandemonium, they're climbing up the... I don't remember the name of it. The Light 
the 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 heaven fortress and getting the top of that so they can meet the light emperor and defeat him just as you defeat his hell version getting rid of him permanently and the whole thing had a truly epic feel to it and was a perfect send off to the game and and really 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 impressed me i can't even stress that enough they didn't even have that much dialogue added to it they didn't have to because it worked flawlessly as is and there's this one tiny little coda they add right at the end where you know after the ending of ff2's proper over here has played you see it again except just after that from the perspective over here and they see they basically get the impression of of them watching over them as they fade away, you know, the ones you just played here in heaven. And it was just a wonderful code of the whole thing. It worked really well. Now, I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Uh, like I said, FF2, in my opinion, is the 11th greatest of the FFs, which is funny because I've been uh, gushing about it quite a bit, but I've gone on record as saying that none of the FFs are truly bad. Yes, even FF10-2, and FF13-2, and FF13, and FF12, and FF8, and FF9, and FF7, and FF6, and FF5, 4, 3, 1, and 2. I just want to say that because I have absolutely nothing against other people who have differing opinions, but no one, in my opinion, ironically, has the right to call anyone else stupid or wrong for their opinions. I have had people come to me and say Final Fantasy VIII is their fa their favorite Final Fantasy, and VIII for a very long time hold held the very bottom slot for me. It has actually since moved up considerably for reasons I'll get into when I get to there. But I don't like other people insisting that other people are wrong for their opinions. And so, yes, I will be reviewing these games because I think they're at the very least good games. I still think they're worth playing. I still think they're worth buying. And there's a reason I still own all of them. However, I do want to add one final note here. This is not me being a fanboy. This is not me saying, oh, it's Final Fantasy and it has to be good. No, 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 no. It has to be good regardless of what it is. I've said this a dozen times before. And it is worth noting that FF10-2 and FF13-2, to use the bottom two of my list, had a noticeable dip in quality for reasons I'll get into when I get there. Still good games, though. Still worth purchasing on sale. Now, with that being said, <laughs> sorry about that, I just have been reading my comments lately. I'm going to go ahead and sign off here and maybe think about doing my FF3 review.